If you'll turn in your Bibles to uh, Psalm chapter 42, and I'm going to be giving a message um, this morning about triumphing over uh, discouragement. And I wanted to share this, and I, I shared this several years ago. I reworked this and added some new things to it, um, kind of make it more relevant for today. But I don't know, probably six years ago, I shared this on a Sunday night at my former church. Um, because we had Sunday evening services too, so I always had two sermons every week uh, to prepare for. So this is something I've taken from a long time ago, but I reworked it to uh, really uh, make it applicable for our day today. How many people believe that a lot of people are uh, discouraged or lonely? Raise your hand. I mean, talk to people. You're involved with people. In your families, in your work, neighbors, how, how many people are experiencing that? I just really feel like this is a timely uh, message, what we need to hear. And so I wanted to read these scriptures for us, and many of you have heard these before, but if you haven't, they're phenomenal verses. And this is uh, David just being really, really raw. People go to the Psalms many times in the Bible when they're down or when they're looking for uh, nurture or hope or is God there. And I know there's many things in life that, that, that uh, bring us to these points. And so I wanted to read these verses for us in Psalm chapter 42. And this is what it says in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Isn't that interesting? My tears have been my food day and night. Tears taste like salt, right? This has always been nurturing himself on. While they continually say to me, where is your God? Verse 4, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude when I went, to the, went with them to the house of God. In other words, to worship. With the voice of joy and praise, and with the multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. It's an important verse, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. For the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill of Mazar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to the God my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of, the, of my bones, my enemies reproach me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Verse 11, last verse. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. This message I'm going to give this morning is about being able to triumph when we're discouraged, having God's triumph in our lives. I believe since this COVID thing especially has happened since the uh, middle of March, there's a lot of, of depression. And depression is one of the most common emotional ailments. And here, King David, he shows us how we can have God's power and God's grace in the midst of our distress. And I was reading this uh, article earlier this week about there was a study that Boston University did back in April, but they printed it in early September, September the 2nd. And they were talking about how uh, in this study that before pre-COVID, about 8.5% of American adults we're having symptoms of depression of some sort or another. This was taken and surveyed in late April. And by that time, it was 27.8% of 
adults, over tripled, were having symptoms of depression, major ones. And they were saying in the study that some of that had to do with economics, like if a person had less than $5,000 in savings as a backup, they were under about 50%, they are 50% more likely to have high stress and high anxiety and depression symptoms compared to those who had more than 5,000 in savings. And you can see that with, with, with you know, if the bottom falls out from under you, you know, you don't have much to go back on or anything. And so it was interesting, this study that, that they did about just depression here lately since, since COVID. And so depression is, is a very real thing. And I got some pictures up there on the screen there. You know, like the one up in the corner, you can barely read the small words, but it's, it says, I'll be okay. That's what you want me to say, isn't it? <laughs> How are you doing? I'm okay. But in silence, isn't that what I'm supposed to say to you? But really, I'm not doing so okay. <laughs> and then there's another one over here. How are you? Fine. But if you look at the small little lettering on that word, confused, anxiety, uh, um, not quite good enough in other people's eyes. I'm not doing that fine. I, I was reading also some other things about women on, on, the, on, the, on the whole usually have a, a much higher rate of anxiety or have the propensity to be uh, more depressed than men. And I don't know if that's so much true. Maybe just men don't admit it. But, uh, the, but those studies were saying that as well, that many times women have a higher rate of depression or the propensity to have depression than the like. And so here we see how David shows us that his hope Hope in God is most alive when we are in great distress. When do you reach out to God the most? In your great times or when it's not so good? Usually when, it, when we're pretty low, if we're honest. We really reach out to God in the lowest times. So David shows us that the hope is most alive, God's hope, in distressing things. And so we see David's distress in these first three verses that I'll read for us again in Psalm 42, verses 1 through 3. He says this in a great, great language and vivid imagery. He says, as the deer pants for water brooks. Anybody like watching the deer come out of, right? At, you know, the sun's going down or in the morning. You can, you can see this picture. The deer pants or thirst for the little stream in front of them. He gets down and, and sips up that water. As the deer pants for water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. So he uses the physical to the spiritual. This is a deer pants for the streams of water. My, my soul is parched, and I thirst for you, O God. He says, my thirst for, my thirst, my soul, rather, thirst for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, where is your God? You know what? Sometimes our tears and our sadness remind us, is God really there? Where's God? Where's God in this? Where, where's God in my turbulence? Where's God in my depressing thoughts? Where's God when things aren't working out so well? Where's God when uh, what I planned didn't really turn out great or some unexpected curveball happened in life and, and you're down in the dumps? Where's God in that? It's just my tears are a reminder. They've been my food day and night. So David is expressing pain partly because of a family problem. His son Absalom, which we know caused a lot of anguish in his life. His, his son Absalom had defected and left the family and took off. Anybody ever have a child that's caused you pain? Okay. Very real. He's saying this. And he, he's expressing that to God, saying, God, my, my son Absalom, he, he's going the wrong direction. David is also exiled at this point. He's in a faraway land. He's in a, in a place preventing him from worshiping God. He's, he's reflecting in verses 4 and 5, reflecting about the time when he was in Jerusalem in God's temple and being able to sing praise. In other words, to be in church. <laughs> than to be with other believers. And I think of this a lot. There's so many people that have not been able to get back to church. There's people watching on Facebook. There's people um, that haven't been in this building in a long time with other believers. I have pastor friends that are 
they're, they're either not still open for church services or they're running 15% of their normal church Sunday attendance because people are isolated. I personally haven't been watching the news for probably four months. You might think I'm crazy, but I think there's a lot of depressing stuff. I am very careful of what I put in this. <laughs> I, I, I'm skeptical. I, I'm wondering, you know, has, has the whole thing turned into something totally different uh, than what it, what, it, what it really is? Or are we being fed the truth? You know, it's one way it's this, you know, one week it's this, and one other, another week it's this. And so a lot of people are being isolated and a lot of people are being discouraged and it's simply because they're not around other believers. They're not around, they're not worshiping God. They're, they're in their own little cave. They're in their own little, you know, complex. Now I know there's a lot of different opinions on all this, but I know that this is causing a lot of spiritual depression and a lot of spiritual anguish in people's lives. And a lot of people are spiritually dry. And when we cannot worship, which is my next part of this message. When we cannot worship, we become spiritually dry. Here David is saying, I, I long to get back to the temple and worship with God's people and sing praise to God. I'm, I'm far away from that right now, physically and spiritually. My tears have been my, my food day and night. They remind me, you know, where's your God? Where's your God in all this, David? And so there's people that are struggling spiritually. And when we cannot worship, we become discouraged and we become lonely. And we need to recognize that because that dries up our soul. And life becomes meaningless. It's just a bunch of do's and, and getting through, you know, the next sequence of the week and your responsibilities and all the things you've got to get done on your list. And, and it becomes empty. Everything is meaningless. If we don't have Jesus in our lives and in our situations and worshiping him and being in contact. And that means a lot more than just attending church on Sunday morning, being in connection with the Lord throughout the week and praying to him when you're down, when you're asking for guidance, when, uh, you know, be, be in contact. I think a great thing we can do as a church is write each other and email and text and encourage. Hey, I was just thinking about you. There was a person at the early service. He just felt really led to pray for us person that was in that service came up to them afterwards, so I'm going to keep praying for you. I don't know why I'm praying for you, but they didn't even know each other. That's cool. You know, I was like, hey, he's listening to God. And he's, try he's trying to get, you know, encouragement because the Lord impressed on that person to pray for the other person that was that was in the service, and that was, that was awesome. And so this discouraging thing that's going on in our, in our world, God wants us to be able to triumph over discouragement. And I can tell you that Satan wants us to be discouraged. Satan wants us to be isolated. Satan wants us to be alone. Satan wants to dry up our souls. Satan wants us not to be worshiping our God. But Jesus wants us to know his truth. Jesus wants to live in our lives. Jesus wants to ignite our soul and our spirit. And we need to follow Jesus Christ and follow him and his word. And if you're discouraged, look to the Lord. Look to God's word. Look to God's truth. Look at God's track record. But don't let yourself become spiritually dead and dry. Because when you do, you will be isolated. You will feel lonely. You will run in the operation of discouragement. And that's the enemy's uh, uh, island that he can get us on so that we become basically uh, concealed into ourselves and become depressed. God does not want us to operate in isolation. God does not want us to operate uh, by ourselves. We are relational people. God has made us in relation to him. God has created the church so we are in relation to one another. That we can carry one another's burdens. One another's burdens. Ask somebody if they need help in the church. Ask somebody, hey, is there anything I can do besides, hey, how are you doing? I would say, oh, I'm okay. It's fine. That's what I'm supposed to say, right? <laughs> not, maybe you're not doing so fine. Maybe you can be a real encouragement to somebody else. And I think we need to hear this message as the deer pants for streams of water. So my soul, my soul deep within me, my soul pants for you, oh God. And I think this is so timely that we, we get into this this morning. So David here, he has two why questions. This is repeated three times 
The same exact verse, actually chapters 42 and 43 are actually one unit, just the Bible breaks it up into two chapters. And so three times, it's repeated three times in uh, Psalm 42, 5, verse 11 of Psalm 42, and in Psalm 43, 5. It says the exact same thing. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you so disquieted within me? He's asking this <laughs> to God, and he's asking this to himself. Why is my soul so cast down? And so that's the first question. Why so cast down? Why so depressed? And that, and that term that we see there in the Hebrew for um, that word cast down, it means to be bowed down or mourning. You ever been in mourning when all you could do is just drop to your feet? Maybe you heard somebody died in your family. You don't know what to do. You get bad news. You say, why are you so bowed down? Why are, you, why are you mourning? It literally means crouched or despairing. Why are you so despairing, oh my soul? Why are you in despair? It means to actually be reduced in your life. There might be something that's been taken from you or it's what was once normal isn't normal anymore. That's what I think we're operating in right now. A person who's cast down, they're reduced or they are weakened. That's what the original Hebrew means. Why are you so reduced, oh my soul? Why are you so weakened? Why are you so drained? Why are you so despairing? Why are you depressed, in other words? <laughs> oh my soul. And so he's asking this question to God, and he's asking it to himself. Why is this? He says this three times. Why are you cast down, oh my soul? If you're feeling this way, it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle first and foremost. And you need to recognize that so you can go to God and say, God, I, I need you. I need you. Help me to get your perspective. Help not make me feel weak. I'm reduced right now. We all go through this in life. There's things that happen in life. Everybody goes through different things, but it still can create the same result. And so... If you felt at all depressed during this time, or maybe it was back a ways and you're not feeling that now, or maybe things have hit you all of a sudden now, things have changed in your life financially, things have changed in something in your family, something has happened, like something's been reduced or weakened out of your life and your soul and your relationship with God, realize that, now that, you're here, realize that God is on the throne and you just need to bow down before him and say, God, I cast my care upon you. Because you care for me, Psalm 55, verse 22. We need to understand when our soul is depleted, when we are mourning, when we are crouched down, when we're not where we once were. You need to be around other believers who care about you. And I mean believers that care about you. What if everybody in this church, and I think we have many that do, but what if every single person says, you know, go up to people, I care about you. Is there anything I can do to help you out? Is there anything you need prayer for? You know, that means the world. And we, I say this, we need this in the church more now than ever. We need each other. And as people come into this congregation, as new people come, we need to go to them and say, we're so glad you're here. No matter how they're dressed, no matter where they come from, they may just be searching and you might just be the friendly face that connects them to God. Amen? That's our job. We need to do that actively. And so as members of the church, as attenders of this church, find ways that you can support one another. I can't do all that. I can try to be a listening ear. I'm only one person. I'm here to prompt you to do that as well for one another. We need that. At every age level, we can be a help to one another and encourage one another. The enemy wants us to be separated, isolated, off by ourselves. That's where he does his work to really discourage and bring people down. But God wants us to live as a Christian community. It's really important we find that. And that if it's not at this church, then find a Bible-believing church that you can find that in. It's not going to be perfect everywhere you go. If you think every Christian church is perfect, there's people involved, including me. I'm one of them, <laughs> and I'm not perfect. And so we need to find a place where we can help one another and do the best that we can.
and make it better. Amen? You can find the negative anywhere you go. <laughs> you can find that anywhere. But uh, try to be a part of the solution. And try, try to be a part of the body of Christ as, as imperfect as, as we are. Um, God's love can still work through us and his message to go out. Then he asked the second question. Why so painful? Why are you so disquieted within me? He asked these two questions. Why so cast down? And he's saying, why so disquieted? Now, this doesn't mean that he's quiet. It actually comes from a root word in the Hebrew, and it means a very loud um, sound or voice, a hum. It means to groan, to moan, to roar. It means a turbulent soul. It means a turbulent soul that is crying out to God. Why so disquieted within me? Why am I going through this, God? Why, why do I feel distant? Why are my enemies against me? Why is this happening in my life? Why am I feeling the, the overload of depression? Why are these circumstances? And he's crying out aloud. And it's a person who's crying out who's in trouble. If you're in trouble, find Jesus Grow in him, find other believers, and be open to being around other people. Some people are becoming so isolated, they don't even know how to relate to other people anymore. They're becoming fearful of other people. That's not good either. That's very, very, very unhealthy. And so, it's a person who's crying aloud, who is in great commotion in their life. And a turbulent soul that's praying and pleading with God. And so David's asking these two questions. Why am I so cast down? Why am I so reduced? Why am I so weakened, man? Why am I so disquieted? Why, why do I have this turbulence in my life? He, he's being raw. He's real. I love this, these verses. And he repeats that three times. Why so cast down? Why so disquieted? Why so much pain? Why, why am I... In this situation that I'm in. And I think this relates so much to this whole thing that we have going on in the world right now. And God wants us to look to him. And he wants us to understand that he is there for us and he loves us. And so the next part of this message is how to triumph over discouragement. How do you triumph over discouragement? And you use several verses here, different parts of the Bible. But how do you, how do, you do that? Well, the first thing is to do not give in to discouragement. That's hard. It's actually easier to stay discouraged and be in that rut. It really is. I mean, it really is. That, that doesn't take much effort. It takes a lot of effort to say, I don't want to be here. I want to be out of here. <laughs> I, I don't want to be in the gutter of discouragement. I want to be not there. I want to be where I need to be with the Lord and have proper perspective, proper a spiritual relationship with him and by proper emotions. And so to not give into it, James 4, 7 says, resist the devil. We've heard this, I'm sure, before. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil can tempt in so many ways. We know that. That's why James says this to the early church. Resist the devil. One of those temptations is, is discouragement and depression. And being isolated and saying, I don't need to be around people. I just want to do my own thing and suck my thumb and be depressed. That's a temptation. <laughs> Whether you realize that or not. We know there's a morality temptation and there's, you know, you can covet things and, and want other things that other people have. And, and there's all kinds of temptations out there. Or to be noticed and be prideful and pat yourself on the back. I mean, there's all types of temptations. But one of those temptations, too, is I'm just going to stay discouraged. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. That word resist, it really means to oppose, to set against, or to withstand against Satan. So to resist means to, I, I'm going to oppose this negative, discouraging mindset that God does not want in my life. That the enemy is trying to bring me down lower so I don't believe in God anymore and get so discouraged that I just check out spiritually. It means to withstand that. It, it means a lot of things, you know, when we're talking about temptations. But to withstand and to oppose what Satan is bringing to us. So 
to resist the devil, and then the Bible says he will flee from you. That means that he, you will escape, or you will run from, or you will shun the devil and his temptation to, to bring you into something that you shouldn't be in, so he can trap you. And it also means that uh, it will vanish or disappear. So resist the devil, oppose him with stand against him, stand up against, set up against him, his, his scheme, and he will vanish from your presence. You must use the name of Jesus. If you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling discouraged, say, in Jesus' name, Satan, call him out. In Jesus' name, I call him Christ's name, and you better flee from me. A.W. Tozer, the old writer, he used to have this book called I Talk Back to the Devil. <laughs> there is a devil. And he's there to discourage you and ruin your life. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, but I have come to bring life to the full abundance. So what do you think the enemy is about? Ripping you up, tearing you down, discouraging you, taking things out of your life, making your life miserable. In fact, making it a living hell. That's his goal. Jesus He's, he's there to give you abundant life. Abundant life. Spirit-led life. Spiritual life. So God wants us to understand it. So don't give in to it. James 1.12, the Bible says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The walk of God is like a long-distance race. He says, blessed are those who endure temptation. You're going to receive a crown. You're going to receive a crown of life, eternal life, for those who stay faithful to the Lord. We need to stay faithful to the Lord, which is the promise to those who love him. So don't give in to it. That's how you can overcome and triumph over discouragement. Another thing is do not be and don't be suppressed by it. Psalm 105, verse 2, great little verse. The last part of that verse says, tell of all his wonders. I want you to hear this. When you speak praise and when you speak God's blessing, and when you speak, hear me on this, when you speak the Lord's name, when you speak his praises on your life, discouragement will dissipate. This is, this is a tool we can have as Christians. Praising God, for I will yet praise him. And we see this in the scriptures. But he says here, verse 105, uh, chapter 105, verse 2, tell of all his wonders. And that means to put, it's a Hebrew word called hue, it means to put forth thoughts, meditate, ponder. It means to sing, to speak, to talk of God's wonders in your life. And when you speak praise, and when you speak of his wonders, when you speak and say, God, I'm going to praise your name no matter what. I'm going to tell of your wonders to other people. I'm going to, I'm going to, if I'm by myself, I'm going to speak and talk about your wonders. Has anybody, okay, has anybody, has God ever done anything for you? Has God ever brought you through an impossible situation? Has he done it more than once? Has he done it? Has he ever left you or forsaken you and said, you know what? I really care less about running that checkers in the side. I don't care about that. Yeah. He is a good God. And we need to remember and tell of his wonders. And when he's brought you through the lowest times, you need to remember that in your lowest times to know that he's brought you out of something back here, even though you're facing a new thing currently, and you need to speak of his wonders. We have an awesome God, and he wants us to speak Jesus' name, and he wants us to praise him for what he's done. Do you think our God is going to, you know, if any, any of you have children, and your child comes to you saying, you know, I really need this, what are you going to do? Stop on him and say, get out of my way, I don't care. No, we have a God that when you bring your need to him, he is going to do things in your life if you really 
really want him to. We have a God that wants us to tell of his wonders to other people. In Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul's writing that from prison, from a hell on earth. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And in Psalm 42, verse 5, that same verse that we've been looking at, why are you so cast down on my soul? Why are you so disquieted within me? He says at the end of that verse, in Psalm 42, verse 5, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. We need to praise him and not be suppressed. Don't be suppressed by discouragement. That's so important. We do not do that. Tell of his wonders. And if it's just the Jesus himself, that's fine. Tell God of all his wondrous works he's done for you. Remember back when he's brought you through things. He's got an incredible track record. Our God is faithful. The problem is with us, we're not so faithful sometimes. We need to bring up his past record, <laughs> his track record, check, tell of his wonders. So don't be suppressed by it if you're going to have a triumph over discouragement. Now, another thing we need to do, a third thing, is to not get down from it. This is a great verse, Psalm 3.3. 3. I never really learned this verse that much until my, my former church. We had this song that we would sing sometimes on, on Sunday nights. I'd never heard of it. It was in an old hymn book. But it, it was it's Psalm 3.3. 3. You're the lifter of my head. You're a shield about me. And look at what the Bible says there. It's on the screen as well. It says, But thou, Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Listen to that again. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. You're my glory and the lifter of my head. What does that mean, the lifter of my head? It means he will exalt you. He will lift and raise you up. He will set you on high. He says he's a lifter up in your head. When your head is low, when you're, when you're discouraged, when you're down, he, he's a shield about you, and he will lift you high. He will raise your countenance. He will raise your perspective. Then he says, a lifter of my head. It means the, the top or your head. But really what it means, it means the total sum of who you are and your soul and your being. And so in Psalm 3.3 3 says that, but thou, Lord, are a shield for me. David says, my glory, you're my glory, you're my shield, you're my glory, the lifter up of my head, the lifter up of my soul, sum, total being, you are my God. And so we need to not get down from it. We need not to give into it. Do not be suppressed by it. If you're going to have triumph over discouragement, do not get down from it. And the last thing is this, is do not give up through it. Many people through the years have given up on their faith, given up on Jesus because life has become too discouraging. And God wants us to understand this through. And Jesus says in Matthew 10, 22, but for those who endure to the end will be saved. They'll be saved. He's referring to tough times or those people that are maybe going through the end times and those kind of things, but to endure to the end so that you'll be saved. And so the triumph over discouragement is to really be careful. Don't give in to it. And when you find yourself doing, do giving into it, back up. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. <laughs> Call him out. Call out the enemy. Jesus, use the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, help me. Help me resist this temptation. To get isolated, to be discouraged. Don't be suppressed. Speak God's wonder. Speak God's praise. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. For I will yet praise him, Psalm 42, 5. Speak scripture. It's very important to get scripture in your mind and your heart. Don't get down from it. It's easy to get down. Say, God, you're a shield for me. You're my protector. I claim your protection over my life and my mentality and my emotions and my being. 
And then, you know, don't give up. It's easy to give up. People give up on things all the time. People can give up in life. It's, it's an ailment. Depression. It's an ailment. Oh, there's a better way out. Just end it. Or it's not the way. See, the enemy wants to discourage you. The enemy wants to keep you isolated. The enemy wants you not to experience the joy of God. The enemy wants to take you out. The enemy wants to have you give up. The enemy wants you to suppress your praise so you don't even call on the name of Jesus anymore. The enemy wants you to go down from it. The enemy wants you to give in and hurt you. And I think there's a lot of people in this isolation that are fighting this. And I think it's a tool from the pit of hell. That's what I think. But I have a God that understands. I said this over and over. We need one another. And we need our Lord leading us. I think what I've learned from this whole experience in our local church here is there's a desire more than now to be together. Amen? Amen. I think we appreciate, like when we had Holy Communion two weeks ago for the first time in like five months. I think we appreciate being together, being able to worship. I think we, we take it more seriously. I think that's a, I think there's some good things happening in the midst. I think we realize that our relationships here is, is, is we need to be more than, hey, how are you doing? I, I think that's starting to happen behind the scenes. That's a good thing. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep faithful. It's so important. But you know what? COVID is nothing in comparison to what will happen in the end times. And we need to grow deeper in God. And are you willing to give everything up for Jesus? There will be a requirement of that at the second coming. Do not get too attached to the things of this earth. Because when you do, you'll be focused and Really, something else will be set up as God or is more important in your life than serving Christ. In other nations, they give up everything to follow Jesus. We need to keep growing in our faith. Ask the Lord to grow in you. But during this time of isolation, we can also as a church and as Christians really be in tune with people around you and their emotions. Look at their body language. Ask the Lord, you know, hey, if you're sensing something about somebody, hey, it's, you know, it's, it seems like there's something not quite right. You know, are, are, you know, is there anything I can help you with? Offer. We have an opportunity to be the light of Christ in a dark time. And I believe there's people that are open more now than they have been in quite a while. Or wondering, I know, I know the non-Christian is like, what is going on in the world? <clears throat> Look at all the issues that are going on. Things are erupting. We got an election coming up in less than a month. <clears throat> Think of what happened after that. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. And without Jesus as our Lord and Savior and our shepherd and growing, the world has no hope because they don't know where to find it. Or they're hardened to Jesus. That's another tool to enemy. So ask the Lord what you, how he can use you to be an encouragement to somebody else. And I think that also lifts your discouragement when you're helping somebody else. Amen? That's a good thing to do. I want us to read these last verses. Jude is a book of the Bible, the Old Testament. Last, one of the last books of the Bible. It's only one chapter long. It has these two verses, Jude, verses 24 and 25. I'd like for us to read this. It's also in your notes. Well, let's read this in unison together. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He's able to keep you from stumbling and make you presentable before God.
just call this morning. I've been saying this a lot lately. I, I really desire a revival to come in, in our church. I mean, a, a new depth of appreciation. And I, I, what revival really is, is saying, God, I know there's something deeper for me to experience. It's a hunger. It's spiritual hunger. You don't have spiritual hunger in a, in a group of Christians, there's not going to be revival. If somebody puts a Big Mac in front of you and you're not hungry, it's probably going to go cold and be thrown in the garbage or you feed it to your dog. But man, if you're hungry, you're going to devour that Big Mac and the fries and the chicken nuggets and the shake and the large Coke. Man, I'm making everybody hungry. You want to get out of here so you get to McDonald's? See, when you're hungry, you, 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 you eat the whole meal. Yeah, man, and you're, you're just craving it. But if we're not spiritually, revival is hunger. Say, so I'm, I'm not satisfied with, I, I know there's something deeper for me to, to, to give over to God. Or God's been showing me, there's this, there's this area, Jerry, there's this area. Yeah, you, you've given some up. There's this area that you won't let me have. And they said, Jesus, I'm broken. And I want there to be anything between me and my Savior. It might be bitterness. It might be an attitude. It might be rebellion. There's a lot of rebellion. It might be something that somebody's done to you. And revival only happens. The preacher can preach till he's blue in the face. The revival happens when God's people say, I want more. I don't want the leftovers anymore. How many people are looking forward to Thanksgiving? Mm, I'm looking forward to the spread at the table at Abby's mom's house. The turkey. Even stuff I wouldn't even eat when I was a kid, but now I eat it because I'm hungry all the time. Like sweet potatoes. I would never eat sweet potatoes. I, I'll eat anything, especially if they put whipped cream on it. <laughs> Not just one pie. I got pumpkin pie, apple pie. Chicken. When, you go to, when you go to grandma's house and you have the spread, it's your own fault if you walk out of there hungry. We're not hungry for God. We're not going to experience his fullness. But hunger starts with a, a dissatisfaction of, of the status quo. In your own life, in your church. So the revival is saying, I want to see God. I want to see God in my own life. I, I, want, to, I want to give him those areas that I'm stubborn in or just just... Maybe it's just lordship. Say, I'm not going to run my own life anymore. I'm going to listen to God and see what God would want for my life. In other words, your ambitions, are they really God's ambitions? Revival happens when God's people say, I'm tired of living status quo Christianity. I'm, I'm tired of lukewarm. I want the deeper things of God. And, and revival happens when you're not saying, well, this is for the person three rows behind me in the message. No, it's, it's saying, no, this is for me. I need to deal with my stuff. See, I can't, I can't, I can't show Linda Boy up what she needs. I can't show Kevin what he needs, and I can't show uh, Amy what she needs. I, I can't do that. That's the Holy Spirit. So it's just looking inward and saying, God, I, I want, I want the full meal. I'm, I'm hungry for the deeper things of God. I, I want to go deeper with you. And you would say, oh, I've, I've been a Christian for all. But God's saying, I want you to go even deeper. And saying, Holy Spirit, come. Come in my life. Help me to see things I don't see. Help me clean out those areas that I've selfishly held for me. And you lay it all at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, come. Do something new in me. May it start with me. 
See, his temptation is just to walk out of here and say, oh, that's a nice message and go home. But God wants to, God wants to shake this church. <laughs> he wants to shake us in a good way. Amen? Amen. And I pray for that. <clears throat> and I pray for that. Because when that starts happening, people are drawn. Hey, that church, they're on fire. Something's happening there. But when you bring a visitor, huh, they're teaching more than just some basic stuff. They're teaching how to really get in contact and consecrated to God through His Son Jesus. So our praise team come up at this time. We're going to sing this last song as the deer pants. Is your soul panting for God? Is God showing you something to lay down before Him? Are, are, you, are you in a mode of just being religious? Or do you want the full meal? Because God, man, he's waiting for you to devour the dessert and the main course and everything. Is there anything you need to lay before God? Revival doesn't happen unless something breaks in us first. But when it does, man, it's a glorious cleansing. Amen? Amen. God wants to see that happen. He wants to see it happen in this church. He wants to see it happen in every church. But it's, it's the people. People have to decide, well, I, I want to go deeper or no, nah, I'm just going to stay where I am. <laughs> and I can tell you, every one of us, including me, we all need to go deeper. There's something God wants us to surrender. There's something God wants to do that's holy that only he can do. Maybe this message has hit you in a different way than what I've even preached on. But if you're down today or you want to lay your life totally before God, say, God, I'm here. You, you can do whatever you want with me. That, that, that's a great prayer to pray. It's a dangerous prayer to pray, but if you mean it, he will take you and do things with your life that you have never have dreamed of because it's on a spiritual realm of surrender. And when God's people do that, the Holy Spirit works and we see a new day come. And I want to see that happen. Amen? Amen. I, I do. I, I pray. I, I, want to, I want to pastor a church where I can't explain what's going on, <laughs> except I know he's doing it. And when that happens, man, I'm, I, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to be as your pastor. That's what I want to see happen in your life. And that other people will be drawn to God's kingdom through this church. So let's stand for our last song. The Lord, this is a meditative song. It's a reflective prayer. And uh, just, just sing this to the Lord. If God's moving in your life, man, if, if he's saying, lay something down on my feet, l listen to him. I'm just the mouthpiece. <laughs> listen to him. He, he's Lord. Amen. Amen.